Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Dr. Jose Angel Aragus, um, and thank you for being here for the Salamander Issue 55 virtual event uh, celebrating this issue. Love it. This is our latest issue. came out in January. Um, it features art by Ruth Marie. Um, as you can see, there's got the centerpiece. We also got eight more uh, pieces in here, and um, as well as excellent poetry and prose, which you're going to hear some um, of which today. Um, and yeah, I don't have too much of an introduction. Usually I read from the editor's note, but um, I always feel like ah, I feel like I'm taking some of the spotlight away. So let me let me just keep it kind of short and sweet and focused. Um, tonight, our readers, we're, we're re I'm really happy. We're really lucky to have with us Quinn Rennerfeld, Maria Pacone, and Evelyn McGuire uh, to read and share their work, their contributors in this issue. And um, for those of y'all who I believe we we do have captions going. So if you would like captions um, for whatever purpose, you can click captions on and then show captions. Um, and one thing I learned is you can also move around the little, like wherever it's transcribing, you can move that square around your screen if you need to, um, if it's in the way for whatever reason. Uh, the other thing is I do, we will be putting things in the chat, uh, links to um, our readers' websites, um, so you can read more of their work. Um, you're welcome to participate via the chat. We do ask that you remain muted throughout um, uh, the event. But um, yeah, if you want to give a shout out in the chat, we love it. If you're like, hey, that line was stunning, that image, um, you're welcome to just share in the chat. Uh, we, we love to see it. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce our first reader. The, the order we're going in is Quinn, Maria, and Evelyn. And I will now read uh, Quinn's bio. Quinn Rennerfeld is a queer parent, partner, and poetry prose writer, earning her MFA at San Francisco State University. Their heart is equally wed to the Pacific Ocean and the Rocky Mountains. Her work can be found in Cleaver, Mom Egg Review, Sand, Salamander, and is forthcoming in A Velvet Giant. They are the recipient of the 2022 Harold Taylor Prize, the Pesaroff Prize in Poetry, and the Anne Fields Award for Poetry. Her chapbooks include Sea Glass Catastrophe from Francis House Press 2020, Demi Goddess Semilustrous, Dancing Girl Press, forthcoming in 2023. Ooh, exciting. And they are also the editor in chief of 14 Hills, a graduate run literary journal with SFSU. And just reading that bio, you make me miss the Pacific Ocean. I spent a couple of years living in um, uh, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, and then McMinnville. Um, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Quinn. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, yeah, I love living by the Pacific Ocean, although recently we had this bomb cyclone. I don't know if people outside of this area are aware of it, but we had all these trees blown down and stuff. So y'all are on, you know, maybe the right coast right now. Um, but I'm so glad to be here. I am so glad to be in this issue. It's such a beautiful, beautiful collection of work and um, also really eager to be reading alongside Maria and Evelyn. Maria's work I was already familiar with, so this is exciting for me and Evelyn's I just got introduced to and it's wonderful. So um, I am going to start with a poem called Garlic just because who doesn't love garlic? Although in this context, I don't know, we'll see. Anyways, garlic, one. During pregnancy, I conceal small cloves of garlic in my vagina to reset my body's pH. Making a baby is all sugar and gin. At night, I'm cloistered in the bathroom, fingertips perfumed as though about to fix a greasy stir fry. But instead, I gently insert the waxy nub just past my lips. I don't want to lose it. I can't explain to you this spot, suddenly a garden plot. Instead, I taste my way down your body, welcome you into my mouth to blot out the other spice that resides inside. Two, garlic rubbed on chimneys and keyholes is thought to ward off your garden variety vampire. Yet here you are, looking at my door. Perhaps you aren't the ghoul I thought you were. Three. A bear fed nothing but garlic can, in three weeks' time, become the woman she desires to be. 
And if she weeps bitter tears that fall like cloves into her palms, she can summon a god who will marry her. If they eat only bulbs from the ground or green scapes shaved onto their plates, she will become pregnant in two weeks' time. Then she, too, must take the remedy inside her to soothe the itch, to burn the mouth upon waking, to make less alkaline the loamy home inside her. Um, next, I'm going to read the two poems that I have in this issue. Oh, I don't know if you can see them because they're, they're blurred out, but... Uh, the first one is called Get Angry That There Is No Field. In no field, there can be no horse grazing on no wild rye or wheatgrass, no yarrow teeming with no ladybugs, no bumbling, bubbling cumulonimbus, and no baby blue sky, no pinkish afternoon or angry dawn, no small roadside stand selling no bunches of native flowers, no bitter root, no prairie cornflower, no daughter manning the family business for no tourists, no lone hackberry tree amidst the thatch of no grasses in the distance, eliciting no mystery of how it came to be there or how one might not reach it, because there are no feet with which to close no distance, and so no one. Um, the second poem in Salamander is called It's Obvious. It's obvious when I've been crying. My face a puffy moon, heart mean and wounded. My voice a flat slick of fat on the soup top. Last night, I dreamt about guns. Guns and creatures lurking in the water. The internet says the guns are my anger. The creature, my, but my butch new haircut that you jokingly disdain. If I had the courage, maybe the guns could be my cock the creature, my confidence, the guns, a cheeky wink, the creature, a couple dancing, hips pressed into a hug. Instead, a passing comment gets to the quick of me, like the blue guts of a flame, and I cry silently on the couch behind a glass of gin and seltzer. Can my body be breasts and my face a man? Can a man have eyeliner and a cunt? Can I femme a dick? These thoughts make me want to bite your neck. They make me want to keep crying. They make my eyes soft and swollen to the touch like bloated undercooked dough. They sharpen my teeth and slacken my resolve. They unmoor the boats so they float out to sea. They bind me to a person I no longer want to be. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to some other pieces. This poem, this next poem is called The Demand. A blank hand, the black matte backdrop of absence. One silent field opens inside a man. One mute expanse closes in the woman. Do not get angry at goodwill, it's glitter. Don't rage at guilt on a face or the gold plated corona of a star. They are only conditions. Faults affront us like summer squalls. We squeal like pre-meat. Every mouth opened releases a fly trapped inside, playing its buzzsaw refrain. The completion of truth may be forever overdue. Words change their ingredients under new rule. There is no salience in what's spoken. Only the descendants of a sound plucked from a baby's mouth, then garbled by a minor bird. Look, says the baby. Look, says the minor bird. The whole holy world looks away. This next poem is called Side Wounds and Paper Moons. I've made paper dolls of us, kissing their thin faces together like two hands in prayer. When I cry, I press fingers to ice, press fingers to eyes to staunch their swelling. A corner of your mouth droops down and drips liquid. You are religious iconography now. Dewy with tears, touch holy, promising renewal. I pray at the crimson slit in Jesus' side that I might come to see you again in two days' time. Until then, I am a licked wound refusing to heal, swollen at the rim, raised scar in the making. 
Um, the next few poems I have are, they're more prose poems, and I'm working on a series of them in which there is a speaker, the I, and a, the, an alien, and they're going on this um, cross-continental road trip that turns into some sort of intergalactic interstellar um, space trip. So all you need to know really is that, that that's the scene that's uh, being set here and that the alien uses they, them pronouns. So <clears throat> an errand. I stopped dressing for the male gaze, I say. I stopped dressing for Fermi's, says the alien. They are suddenly breasted or I'm suddenly noticing. My own chest deflates. We walk to the beach at night and plant my dog's baby teeth in the sand. My, my gaze grows tentacles. All I can see is a well-filled pair of jeans, a waist I could put my teeth to. My head fills with rigid thoughts. I touch my face. It is rubbery as a meat market fish, numb from cold. When we kiss, I can't tell lips from the cosmic, sand from existence, stars from shivers. A marvelous many things spring into being under the freckled guise of night. Our tongues only fragment when the sky starts to lighten at the rim and we part, two warm and awkward strangers on their way to an errand with no end. Some solitude. Though space is silent in my mind, there is a Doppler effect of womb sounds, shimmering heartbeats, galactical concordance. Some days I see a sliver of recognition, like the flash of sharp light a comet makes when crossing the atmosphere's transom. My pupils, unguarded, are pierced by clarity. I can't probe the feeling for too long or it scatters. Holding on to anything feels precarious. I cannot bouquet time, self, stasis, safety for keeping. The slippery character of existence has at least two qualities, a fish escaping the net, a tongue tracing the lips. I just wanna make sure I was doing okay on time. Okay, I have three more, two of which are from this same series. This is called The Game. Do we blend together? I ask in bed, holding our arms parallel like train tracks or fence slats. A foolish question, knowing full well the alien can shift like an octopus. It has the slippery, cigar-shaped innards of a chrysalis, ready to shuck its outer casing for a new shape. And I am entrenched in flesh, body-bound half-wit, antithetical to evolution. Let's play the chimera game. I can't fault them for knowing how to get me out of my head. They weave their limbs through mine. Our legs catch like seaweed. We play the trick in the mirror where their head becomes my head. My cranium smooth as a fish gut, a smile and incision in the skin. I'm hungry for additions, a tail, a talon, a fin. We burn the moment down to its ashy end, collapse on the mattress where I become whole again, but smaller. How a fat worm shrinks to a thread in the hot sun. My outline, a pale subtraction of what I could have been. This next piece is called Iterations. We walk on the road's shoulder, the car behind us gutted of gas. It's 10 miles to town in any direction. I wonder if aliens can sprout wings, but this feels derivative. What use does an interstellar traveler have for the anatomy of little flying things? What use does the alien have in metamorphosis when they've already been everything? The desert sun has a way of making thoughts more potent, considerations a poison. In stretches of silence, I am forced to consider the iterations of being, like how, by evolving, I become an arch rival to the archival versions of myself. And what do I revise in my changing? Is it the actions or just the skin, the philosophy or the attraction? My thoughtful head has swollen to the size of the aliens. And that's the end of um, those alien prose poem bits there. Um, I just have one more piece. And as mentioned in my bio, I'm also a parent. I have two children. Um, and this piece really came out of the cacophony and chaos that exists in being in a small 
apartment because I'm in uh, the Bay Area. So where we also have very small, expensive uh, apartments. And so having all that chaos around you and trying to write at the same time can be um, a challenge, but sometimes things come out of it that are really fun. So this is called Domestics with an X. Small silver platter holds mouse-sized cheese. House now presenting comical overtures of giant hands plucking tiny wedges of Wensleydale. A hard ball hits the door corner. Glass rattles in the interior of the space. The skull rattles also. The Congress of the mind demands the virtual order. Show us the head of Holofernes. Show us the languid cat licking sunshine. Show us the yo-yo infinity trick again and again. That's it. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. Feel free to show some love. A lot of love in the, the chat there as well happening. Now, I'm, ah, I used to teach a course. I, I, I have a course. I want to teach it again called um, It's on Speculative uh, Creative Writing, specifically like poetry, nonfiction, and fiction. And yeah, I'm, I'm here for speculative poetry. I think that's it's amazing. Those prose poems were amazing. The, the poems, just thank you so much. I'm so glad we got a chance to have you here. Thank you so um, much. Right. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, let me get Maria's bio in front of me. All right. So moving forward, uh, our next reader is going to be Maria S. Bacconi. Uh, she is a queer Korean American adoptee. She won the 2020 Queen City Review Summer Poetry Prize and grants from Kenyon Review, Grub Street, the Juniper Institute, and elsewhere. She is Chestnut Review's managing editor. And yeah, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Maria to the virtual stage. Hi, all. I'm so excited to be here. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. And I'm also thrilled to be in Salamander. So I've got two Salamander poems tonight. Um, and I have chosen two poems that I think work with those. So um, without further ado, I'm going to read my first poem. And the title is To the Guy Who Made Me a Pretzel at the Mall and Wouldn't Give Up Until I Told Him Where I'm Really, Really From. Thank you for your extreme interest in my personal life. Thank you for asking these questions with conviviality and not confederacy. Thank you for dogging me after my from Massachusetts wasn't good enough. Thank you for reminding me where I fit in your vision of what America should or should not be. Thank you for clarifying what you meant via inappropriate language after I deliberately misunderstood you a second time. Thank you for including a free dipping sauce in my order. Thank you for the solar panel smile you installed after I told you my ancestors come from Korea. Thank you for not asking South or North Korea. Thank you for encouraging me to greatly enjoy the rest of my day. Thank you for helping me become a kinder version of myself who can fold this poem like a grade school love note to my brothers, my sisters. Um, my second poem is a Salamander Realm, and it is called Maleficent. One, in seventh grade, I learned to pray, in Spanish is rezar, edged like razor, work and worship. I learned adoption was life's sword, maldicion, malediction, Bendicion, benediction, 
doubled and edged the attitude. I should give thanks, I learned. Two, she left her blood woven throughout. Her curse, venison. Her hope, imprecation, I learned. In high school, Latin cursus, track, trajectory. Swooping back, pendulum, defixio. To fix her, defix her. To defix her, fix her. Gladius, sword of God, I raise my voice. Recite this oration, erasure, as taught to give. Praise, gladiolus flower bowing, crimson in the pews, I learned. Three, head bowed, do the work, the worship. Gladius Dei, Mater Dei, kneel before my saviors, savor gratitude. I learned what words are twinned. Alma, soul, Allah, wing. Why cracking open language never made for you? Cleves, Gladius Meus, Mater Mea, pray, mother that you are not made bad, making bad, not the bad doer, doing bad works, that your progeny can narrate, orate, explain away the curse with which you leveled her, swoop of sword, swoop of wing. Allah, Alma, Allah, Oma, I learned. Four. Magnificat anima mea dominum, exultavit spiritus meus in Deo, salutare meo, quia respectsit humilitatem ancile suae, beatem me dicent omnes. The swoop of these words, her same sided wings, the rezar of my life, it cut. This poem is called Through Slash Put. I want the watching, the days when you could hang out on your porch and see fields of whiteness are over. When brought to heal the nation before Congress, you spit back bites on the price of a branch, olive slash oak. No, more screaming for days, ghosted up like Dr. Seuss books. Someday you will have to listen. News will even include us in its white, black, and occasionally Hispanic statistics. Us invisible Asians pinked over as model minorities erased by skin colored crayons. Visibility is our new superpower. I want witnesses. I want our voices to spill from the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, whitewashed foam dissolving like the mirage of our otherness to reveal our suffering with and from you. We will build this better nation with or without you. This is my second poem in Salamander, and it's a weird hybrid form. And this poem is called Minority Report. 
white guy number one to receive white guy number two named fellowship for distinguished position as dead white guy number three chair of university department X. White guy number one named recipient of prestigious grant AA by committee of white guy number two, white guy number three, white woman number one, marginalized writer number one. Marginalized writer number one selected as reader for mid-tier paying lit mag whose mission statement reaffirms mid-tier lit mag's commitment to publishing diverse voices. Marginalized writer number one finds work of marginalized writer number two in Q upvotes work. White woman reader number one doesn't understand marginalized writer number two's work downvotes. White woman editor number one sends form decline message on submittable. Marginalized writer number one granted space in number issue of low tier non-paying lit mag. Marginalized writer number two denied space because of work that was too similar. Said too similar work contained a singular mention of marginalized group alpha. Work was in all other ways different. Marginalized writer number one writes marginalized work number one, becomes famous, spends life being asked about marginalized work number one. Solicited for more marginalized works, writes marginalized works numbers two, three, four that sell. Writes work number one, which doesn't sell and is discouraged by agents and editors. Marginalized writer organization number one operates on shoestring budget serving marginalized writers number two through 40. Funding comes from a single grant and marginalized writer donors. Writer organization number one operates on million dollar budget serving marginalized writers numbers two through 40 and white writers number one through 8,000. Non-paying marginalized writer lit mag run by marginalized editor number one publishes amazing work, generates no attention, loses money. Meanwhile, prestigious paying lit mag run by white editorial team and marginalized writer number one publishes a handful of big name solicited marginalized writers, a plethora of big name solicited white writers, and a smattering of writers from the slush at a ratio of at least 75% white. Observant literary organization conducts DEI review, finds disturbing results. Non-absorbent literary organization lauds recruitment of two siloed marginalized writers points to latest publication of marginalized writer number two to claim that they are making progress TM and reaffirms commitment to publishing the best work regardless of demographics. Marginalized writers numbers two through 25 meet in marginalized writer safe space, discuss state of publishing industry, applauds success of marginalized writer number one while lamenting frustrations of marginalized writer number one being sole representative of group to mainstream. Share ideas for hastening diversification of publishing industry. Pipeline for getting industry giants to hear said ideas is similar to giant space vehicle that allows Jodie Foster to talk to her father in contact. Circumstance for doing so, no less sublime. Thank you. Hey, no, that was awesome. I feel like 
I'm going to type it in the chat, but I'm also just going to be, I'm just going to say shots fired. Now, when I read that poem in the queue, I was so excited. I'm just like, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm like, you're saying it. You're saying it. And I'm like, we we got to provide space for this. Like, this is this is the conversation about literary publishing. So uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you for, for that, for that wonderful, wonderful awesomeness. Um, all right, and to round us out, we have a, just a another like a, my job is so cool. Like I literally like I feel bad for my students because like I don't dwell on how stressed I am, but I I know I mentioned it at least once at the very beginning. I'm just like I'm so like so busy, but hi, I'm a professor now, right? Like so I I switch into that mode. I try to like not dwell on that because nobody wants to just hear a guy complain, but like. The cool part of my job are evenings like this and getting to read these wonderful pieces and and decide and 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 curate and get to um, provide space for them um, and really like just these connections. And so for those of y'all who um, have read the issue or this is the first time you're hearing of the issue or just everyone who's here, thank you for taking the time to be here for uh, making space for literature in your life. Um, and just anything you've sur you had to survive to get to this point in your life, like thank you for being here and, and just holding space with all of us. Um, let me switch over. I'm going to introduce Evelyn McGuire. This this story is just phenomenal. Um, and I yeah I'm not gonna no spoiler alerts or nothing. Um, Evelyn McGuire is an MFA candidate at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and she is at work on her first novel. And it's interesting on my on my screen here, the the bios get smaller as it goes. Um, and I'm just sharing that with you because why not? I'm I'm friendly that way. But anyway, without further ado, here is Evelyn McGuire um, to read her story. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so much for having me here. And listening to that work was so amazing. Um Yes, it's a fun day for me. I um, submitted my thesis today, so it's feeling like really good. <laughs> this is my little like celebration for the day. Um, yeah, really exciting. So I'm graduating this semester and just like, oh, big relief moment. Um, yeah, echoing my previous readers, like thank you so much to Salamander, to the team. It has been such a delight to be in this magazine. Um, I'm an emerging writer, as we like to say, and I have always really admired Salamander. And so I had kind of one of those really embarrassing moments when I got the story accepted, where I was like, you know, looking at my computer like, me? Um, so yeah, good, good moment for sure. Um, it's kind of a long story, so I'm just going to read part of it, um, and hopefully that will, you know, entice you enough to want to race and buy this issue and buy some for your friends and just pass it around. Um, okay, this story is called The Bar at the End of the World. The local news projected to the bar by way of their staticky cafeteria tray-sized TV warned of severe storm conditions, possible flash flooding. That afternoon, the odd car that passed by did not stop. Everyone had a home to get to, or higher ground, at least. Jaundiced air stirred Hootie's gut. Animal instinct, she figured. Get away, run far, far away from here. End of days, said Manny, the bar's cook. End of the world, apocalypse incoming, the biblical flood, make your peace. He wiped a cloth across the counter, cleaning nothing. What day is it anyway? Stop, said Hootie. What year is it? You know what year it is. Manny whistled, shrugged, sighed, wiped the counter. Footage of a previous catastrophe from years prior was shown. A car spiraled down a rushing brown river, not a river, a highway, the driver visible inside. Did that person die? The news anchors didn't say. Turn around, don't drown, captioned the scene. Hootie found it deeply disturbing that no mention of the driver's fate was made. Manny prayed to the crucified Jesus he had nailed onto the wall. The bar was down off Route 66 in Arizona. Once there had been a sign with a name out by the road, but that had rusted and crumpled over, and by nature of the bar's isolation, there weren't many regulars. So though the bar had once had a name, it was no longer remembered. Customers passing through, college students on a road trip, truckers pulling long hauls, 
CD looking types who didn't do much talking, didn't care much to know where they were drinking or what they were drinking or who was serving it to them. In lieu of a name, the owner, Carl, relied on a glowing red neon sign in the form of a flashing martini he'd bought on eBay to lure clientele off the pockmarked highway. Back, forth, back, forth. The glass angled from side to side, a hypnotic pendulum, the olive rolling from north to south, from south to north. Which way, traveler? Secured to the top of an old stepladder whose feet were locked in a wide barrel of concrete, the glowing martini was a beacon of light amid an endless desert, and at night amid an endless black void. There wasn't even a martini on the menu. Wind billowing their shirts like parachutes, Manny and Carl Wrench closed the long forgotten shutters. Chance of a dust storm. Zero visibility, get home and stay there. The shutters gave with awful shrieks. One snapped off, had to be nailed up. Hootie watched from inside one by one until the last window was sealed. The hammer pounded, an immediate sense of suffocation. I should get home before it gets bad, Carl said, kicking shut the doors behind him and Manny, his voice too loud for the hush that had fallen over the bar. Gotta get back to Penny. Penny was Carl's dog, a slow Labrador. She can't stand storms. Sweat formed a collar around Carl's neck, staining his white t-shirt a sickly beige. He looked at Hootie. You gonna be all right here? She shrugged. Sure. Carl looked to Manny. And you? Fine, boss. Right then. Through the crack in the boarded up window, Hootie watched Carl get into his rusted truck, watched as he used his blinker, though no one was there to see it. And then there were two, Hootie said. Hootie had worked at the dive bar long enough to witness its degradation, its slouch from air-conditioned haven to one wonky fan outpost. In the daylight, the bar looked like it had been birthed by the desert, commanded to rise, like it would stand until the end of all things. The windows were encrusted with a sandy film, the once white walls were now the same terracotta color as the earth. At certain hours of the night, if one stood looking at the bar from a good hundred yards away, just to gain perspective, as Hootie sometimes did, to see things in a new way, to mimic the sensation of standing on one's head or holding an air for too long. The bar looked primordial. Hoodie had learned that word, primordial, during her stint as an online anthropology major. Yes, primordial, at certain hours of the night. One might feel tempted to see how far they could go. How far could they walk with the human light of the windows, the siren call of the martini still in view? A faint blip on the horizon, and then darkness, and then what? In anticipation of a power outage, Manny prepared a final supper. Burgers, creamed corn, beans from the can, instant noodles that smelled like the childhood afternoons when Hootie's parents had work. And like cinematic clockwork, just as the plates were filled, the power was lost. Hootie hadn't realized she'd been relying on the background voices of the newscasters, repeating words like caution, chance, likely, warning, shelter, until they were gone. With electricity's hum silence, the din of the storm swelled. The wind wrapping around the bar, the groaning of the windows, and in the distance, thunder. A light rain had begun, could be heard pinging on the roof. Manny struck a match. Can you remember the last time we had a storm? Hootie asked. Not like this, he said, the red glow of the candlelight giving him a new face. Hootie couldn't remember the last time she hadn't spent an evening writing food tickets, watering down drinks, waiting for customers to come, praying for customers to leave. It felt unnatural to be seated there. Across from Manny, candles lit between them like they were playing at a date, like she had awoken from a long disorienting nap and found herself in a room she didn't remember falling asleep in. When was the last time we left the bar, Hootie asked, food untouched. Manny chewed. We saw that movie. Movie. In Flagstaff, that movie, you know. Manny let the memory drift off, forgotten. Hootie had no idea what he was talking about. A strange sensation fluttered about her rib cage. She felt at once very aware of her face, her skin, the realization that her forehead was coated in cool sheen, the sensation of a mosquito brushing along her arm. A hole had worn through her sock along her ankle. Could she feel her lungs moving? She felt her pulse in her fingertips, fight or flight, or the mere realization of existence. For a long time, Hootie had avoided admitting the tenure, the length of her tenure, telling those whose drinks she poured instead that she was just passing through here, would be gone when the summer ended, was jetting off for the holidays, was taking a gap year. And telling who? Customers who didn't care, drifters who would forget her face as soon as their drink was sweating in their palm. So what did it matter what they thought? But it did matter to Hootie, it mattered a great deal. Unprompted, she would say she was in school, studying law or marketing or Russian literature, 
And then when she was too old for that easy lie, she'd say she was an actress, that she was, in fact, waiting on a call from her agent that very night that she expected to soon be a hard-boiled lady detective in an upcoming TV serial. And when that became embarrassing, when Dan, the waiter, laughed one too many times overhearing this, she finally called herself a bartender. This was much like brewing the gas station coffee and writing barista on your resume. For a long time, she also insisted that her name was not Hootie, the nickname that the bar had thrust upon her. What kind of a name was Hootie anyway? But it became easier to adapt, to transmute herself into this place, to shed the trappings of old skin. So she tried Hootie on for size. Hootie, who worked at the dive bar, who had been here for so long, she sometimes had a nightmare that if she set foot outside the perimeter of the property, she would simply crumple, her flesh flaking away, peeling off in grotesque sheets as her bones clattered to the asphalt, her eyeballs rolling out of her skull like pool balls. The bar had become strange. Hootie looked around, bewildered. There was Manny, same. And the outlines of the furniture, same. The JM plus LP carved deep into the corner of the table at which she sat, same. But didn't it feel as though they were on a great rocking ship, sheltered in the cabin while the sea roared outside, slapped against the hulls. The flames flickered, swayed with the rolling of the surf. If Manny was experiencing the same offset reality, he gave no sign. His wide jaw was set, serious. Thick and unruly eyebrows gave his face a commanding presence in the candlelight, a mole like a tick next to his ear. But he tried to dismiss the notion that she had never truly seen Manny's face before. Hootie slept in the back room. Carl had offered it free of charge when she began to complain about the commute. At first, it was only late nights, and then it became most nights, and then her rent and flagstaff was raised, and wasn't it a good thing to give up driving? She was doing her env environmental part. And why not save her money? One day she'd need it. Manny also slept in the back room, had taken up residence there sometime after she did. It was, in a way, like camp. Hootie and Manny had small cots, army-style fold-out beds on either side of the far wall, a small window in between them so coated with grime they didn't need a curtain to blot out the morning. They slept amid cans of baked beans, listed as homemade on the menu. Crates of condiments, untapped kegs of beer, stacks of toilet paper, of dish soap, of glass tumblers to replace the old ones that would soon be broken. Their tiny TV was propped up on an industrial-sized box of instant noodles. A wooden crucifix was nailed to the wall above Manny's bed. He had put it there some years ago, seemingly from nothing. One day the wall was bare and the next Jesus nailed to his cross was there staring at Hootie in mournful agony. Since the day of Jesus's arrival, whether Manny was Tuesday sober or Friday flushed, before bed he would clasp his hands to his chest, collapse to his knees and pray, sometimes in silence and sometimes not. Forgive me, he would begin while Hootie lied on her cot, turned towards the wall, offering as much privacy as one could in such a room. Forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. Hootie supposed that Manny was her closest friend. The other staff came and went, sometimes for a season, sometimes a year. They lived along strange Route 66 offshoots, down dirt roads, in a mobile home without its wheels, in an apartment atop a gas station, in a survivalist bunker, in a yurt. They'd pull up for shifts in old trucks, decrepit SUVs, roaring motorcycles, one working headlight sedans, everything the color of everything else, the color of the desert. Dan, who had worked at the bar for two years, had given Hootie her name on her first shift. Is she hot at least? Not yet, Hootie had asked, when Dan explained how she bore a resemblance to the blonde member of the band Hootie and the Blowfish. Dan nearly threw up with laughter. Carl lived in a proper old rancher some ways down the highway. Hootie had been to Carl's house a few times, had driven Carl home after staff parties or his birthday. On the rare occasions, he allowed himself too much to drink. Hootie didn't mind taking Carl home. He was kind, quiet. She would pat Penny on her dopey yellow head. Once on a New Year's morning some years ago, Carl had told her that he used to be a competitive Irish dancer in his youth, that he still danced sometimes in his office. For a while, Hootie kept a pinned up calendar by her bed. At the end of each shift, she would add a large red X, never missing a day, not a single one, until Manny had asked, what are you counting to? I don't know, she said. The next morning, she dumped the calendar in the bin. Hootie often said to Manny as a joke, as an explanation, as a serious concern, that they had fallen out of time, those trapped at the bar, that they were in some realm of purgatory, a metronome of monotony. You wait, Manny would say, spatula pointing. Zombies, nukes, government goes big brother and starts killing us, killing us more than they already do, right? 
Everybody will be coming down here. This is the place to be. They ate without speaking. The storm picked up. Rain pelted the roof with tiny fists, desperate in its desire to break through the steel and wood. Water had begun to pool by the front door, leaking in through that uneven frame. Hootie had a terrible feeling about that. The food transformed from decent to bland to tasteless to paste like gruel the longer she and Manny sat through the celestial cacophony of the storm. Manny was tense. She could see it in the flex of his fingers on his fork and the way he screeched his knife against his plate again and again, shrill like a wounded animal. Hootie got up, grabbed a towel with the intent to plug up the growing puddle. She rested her palm on the knob. She would look at the storm. She was being silly, growing nervous over bad weather. One look to see that the rain was rain and the wind was wind and that in the morning it would be gone. By the pricking of my thumbs, Hootie whispered, she opened the door. And that's where I'll leave you guys. Just so curious. What happens? You'll have to spend, you'll have to spend nine dollars and find out. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was just thinking, I'm like, we are one of the it's gonna sound crass, but like take the words, like uh one of the cheaper magazines. <laughs> <laughs> like some of these things get into double digits, and you're just like, oh man, I like the work. But anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much and huge congratulations. I'm so glad that you get to cap this uh, this day of accomplishment with this uh, event. Thank you for sharing your work and sharing that story. And oh, yeah, you got to get to the end, y'all. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's been so lovely. Oh, of oh, course, of wait, course. I have 